call this um, meet the whole meeting to order. Roll call, please. Horn. Here. Bulk. Excused. Bowers. Here. Decker. Sorry, excused. Okay. Yeah, uh, Gisha. Here. Hammond. Here. Hannah. Here. Heidemann. Excused. Koth. Here. Kittleson is here. Montemayor. Here. Radke. Here. Reinfleisch. Here. Vanderweel. Here. Versi. Here. And Wangaman. Here. A quorum is present. You, Vice President. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Looking for approval of previous minutes? So moved. Second. second. Motion's been made and second to approve the previous minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Motion carries. Next on the agenda is a statement from the Chairman of the Committee of the Whole, myself, regarding the role of the Mayor during the committee meetings. Uh, I put this on the agenda based on a communication I received from Alderman Wangaman. Um, thank you for your concern. Um, the, the request was to see uh, if having the Mayor speak during the Committee of the Whole is appropriate or not. Uh, and Alderman Wangaman, um, you are correct that the, uh, the statutes show that the Mayor is not uh, a member of this committee That's correct. Um, uh, to speak. Uh, I have been aware of that uh, and was aware of that. Uh, my decision, though, in the last meeting to allow him to speak was based on the role I see of this committee, which is to gather as much information as possible, uh, debate it amongst ourselves, uh, and make a decision amongst ourselves. Uh, and amongst ourselves, there's only the 16 of us and the mayor. There's only one person that's a full-time person that is in City Hall, and that is the mayor. Uh, and so I deemed it important that the mayor could speak on it, in issues that were facing the community of the whole. Uh, in particular, it was the, the fire department and the ambulance service, uh, knowing that um, the mayor was, was um, uh, traveling to gather informa information on that. So uh, I did make a decision to allow the mayor to speak, uh, and it's one that I will cont continue to do so. However, uh, that decision by the chair is not final. Uh, this is, of course, your committee, not mine. And um, any decision of the chair can be um, uh, objected to. And that objection, if seconded, goes to a vote. Uh, and the majority of the, of the committee can overrule the ruling of the chair. Uh, so my word is not final. Uh, if, and if it's deemed inappropriate from the committee, uh, it is the committee's decision, uh, not mine, to allow the mayor to speak. Um, because again, technically, it's not you know, part of the committee, uh, but my view has always been to gather as much information as possible. That's the role of this committee versus the Common Council uh, as they meet, so that we can have the information that we need to discuss items. So, Alderman Wagman, I thank you for bringing that up. And you have a question? Uh, not, a, not a question, just a statement. I had a conversation with the city attorney, and uh, he informed me that the status of the mayor at these committees is that of an interested citizen. Mm -hmm. And I I really strongly feel that we should observe the same protocol as we would if anybody else in the back room wanted to speak. I know the mayor's got a special position, but uh, we have espoused the feelings many times that we should follow Robert's Rules of Order. And I think you could justify that position in Robert's Rules of Order. And so whatever your decision is at the time, I guess it, it's, it's entirely up to you. But I would certainly suggest that uh, we follow Robert's rules of order and uh, treat the mayor the same as we would any other citizen who's here to, see, to witness these proceedings. And uh, I'd, I'd just like to say there, there's nothing personal in this. I just think that if we're going to follow the rules, we're going to follow the rules. And if we're not going to, well, then we're not going to. But uh, technically, I think we're bound to follow the rules of Robert's Rules of Order because these committees have always done that. So even, even in the smallest of committees, we do that. You know, we uh, non-committee members do come to our meetings and they sit along the sidelines and they raise their hand when we want to speak and the chair acknowledges them and they can speak. I have no problem with that. But I, I think what's the old saying, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You know, we, we maybe should follow those kind of rules. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wongman. Uh, Alderman Wongman, and uh, I don't disagree with that. Um, the mayor in the past has sat at my desk. It hasn't been set up here. Um, I, as, as far as I'm concerned, that's a convenience factor. Uh, and yes, in smaller committees, uh, we, you know, we would call on visiting all the persons or the mayor uh, to sit. Um, however, I think as a matter of time issue and convenience issue, having the mayor come up to the podium all the time, it's only the action the reason I allowed him to sit at my desk and, and use the board at that point in time. I have no problem where he sits. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, not, so that's, 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 that's really not a me. If, he, if you want to let him sit next to you, that's fine with no, me. And, and that's the reason why I had done so. <laughs> it, there was nothing unruly or, or trying to uh, bend the rules or break the rules in any way. I it know. was just a matter of uh, there's information from the mayor that I felt was important. I uh, thank you for your opinion and concern. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, are there any other discussion points on my issue? Seeing none, we'll move on. Um, and we move, that brings us to an update from the mayor regarding the fire department ambulance service. Uh, mayor, as far as I'm concerned, you may sit at my desk. If you'd like to sit at the, stand at the podium, you may do so as well. I'm sure you want me to speak? I do. Okay. <laughs> uh, if I may, Chief Herman will also join me. Please Chief, please do. <clears throat> Okay, the uh, chief and I uh, took an excursion to uh, Minnesota. We visited two cities, uh, which were Eden Prairie and Maple Grove. Eden Prairie, we spent the uh, better part of a, uh, an entire day uh, with the city manager, uh, the, uh, the fire chief, um, and uh, toured uh, their, some of their fire departments and uh, the city in, in general. Uh, we took a tour of the city, including the industrial areas, the neighborhoods. Um, and uh, it, the, the differences in Eden Prairie in Sheboygan uh, I found alarming um, as opposed to the similarities. Uh, similarities population-wise, uh, they are very similar. Uh, big difference between Sheboygan and, er and Eden Prairie is the density. Um, Eden Prairie is a community of about 60,000 people. Um, average household income is a little over $110,000, which is almost triple what Sheboygan is right now. Uh, average uh, home value is $306,000. A lot of single family homes um, spread apart as opposed to what we have in Sheboygan, <laughs> which is uh, a lot of uh, multifamily structures. And uh, the age of our homes in general is, uh, is much greater than what Eden Prairie is. There's, Basically, uh, not much in Eden Prairie in the entire city that's over 30 years old. So it's, it's a very modern city. It's a suburb of, uh, of Minneapolis. Um, it's one of the concentric circles that run around Minneapolis. And uh, um, a lot of their, um, with their, their <coughs> average household income and home value, um, it is a very, uh, <coughs> um, a lot of well-tended properties. A lot of uh, modern structures are, are sprinklered, um, hardwired uh, smoke alarm systems. Um, now, the, the, their fire department themselves, basically, they run um, somewhere around uh, um, 10 full-time employees in the fire department, and I believe it's 90, 90 paid on call firefighters. Now, by paid on call, um, that basically means that uh, they are paid for, the time, for their training and they are paid for the time that they are actually called out. They do not have an ambulance service, as we do. Um, their average response time, and I'll let the chief cover some of this, um, is about uh, uh, seven minutes. Uh, basically what they do in and, and, and the average, average response time where they get enough firefighters on scene to actually fight a fire is about 11 minutes. Um, their main goal there is to save the adjoining structures. What they do is they go to a fire. Um, the first unit there puts a hose on the one building. The next unit puts a hose on the other building. And then they start fighting the fire itself. Uh, in other words, they, uh, they save a lot of basements. However, they do not have... Um, the, the density that we have as far as fire spreading rapidly into adjoining buildings. The 
Eden Prairie, and I believe the Maple Grove Fire Department has not had a bur burning building entry in 10 years, I believe. 10 or 11 years that they have actually entered a burning building in, in a rescue operation or in order to go into a building to try to save the building from the inside. Um, that, is, that is one of the major differences. Um, the, uh, I'll, I'll, let the, I'll let the chief speak more on this, if, if you will, chief. As the mayor said, um, they do not really do interior firefighting. They basically get there and protect exposures. Uh, we asked both of the fire chiefs that we spoke to um, if they were dealing with the property density similar to Sheboygan, um, whether, what their results would be. And both of them said that more than likely they would have a couple of structures on fire uh, before they actually could put them out. Um, just because of the closeness that we have of our housing. Uh, they do not experience that there. I would say the subdivisions that we drove through, um, probably the closest house was 40 to 50 feet apart um, with actually no uh, rear exposures. They're all cul-de-sac type uh, subdivisions. Uh, it was interesting that neither city has ever had a fire fatality in the history of their city. Um, I think that's can be attributed to a number of things. Uh, the average age of their cities were about 35 to 40 years old for the residents. Um, and also they had a very uh, aggressive code program, uh, as the mayor said, with hardwired smoke detectors in all <coughs> homes. And I think a lot of that has to do with its newer construction. Uh, if all our, I, I think if we look back to all our homes 20 years old or so, they uh, also all have hardwired smoke detectors. Um, a lot of their, uh, all of their uh, commercial buildings are sprinklered by code and monitored by outside agencies, uh, which is a big advantage for early notification. Um, and some of their homes also are sprinklered and monitored by outside agencies. Uh, it's interesting, in Eden Prairie, uh, the fire chief was looking into a program to require all homes to be retrofitted with sprinkler systems. They're looking ahead to, yes, their city's only 30 years old now. At some point, it'll be 70 years old, and they'll be facing issues uh, similar to what we have. And they're looking at mandating sprinkler systems in the homes in an effort to keep the cost of their fire department down. Uh, as the mayor said, uh, we didn't really see any uh, industry in those cities. It was more uh, individual type light manufacturing and office buildings. Um, as far as like a mall area, it's more strip malls with satellite type buildings so they don't deal with uh, the 8th Street uh, areas that we have with adjoining buildings that share common walls. Anything I'm missing? One, one thing I, I would like to add, and this is all preliminary information. This is not uh, to be taken as gospel. We have a lot more work to do um, on other communities. Um, Eden Prairie averages for four structure fires a year in their community of 60,000 people. Um, that's a, a big difference. I believe that uh, uh, Maple Grove uh, was under 10 a year. A huge difference from what we experience here. So when we Compare, um, which I hate to use, use this phrase, but as the, uh, as the uh, was it Eden Prairie or Maple Grove? Chief of Eden Prairie. Uh, Eden Prairie. Chief of Eden Prairie, he said comparing Sheboygan to Eden Prairie is like comparing apples to potatoes, uh, which I found kind of ironic, not even apples to oranges. Um, one, one thing uh, we did see a huge difference in uh, in both Eden Prairie and Maple Grove um, was basically the uh, outlook of the people. People seemed uh, generally uh, content. Um, people seemed to be happy to live where they did. People seemed to uh, uh, be enlightened in a way that they were, they were very, very happy with their government and the way things were run there. Um, their government structure is totally different than ours. They have a grand total of uh, four aldermen, uh, all at large. 
<laughs> um, Good. Yeah, they're, uh, they're, 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 it's a totally different community than we have here. Um, it's newer, it's younger, it's more prosperous, it's more residential. Uh, Mayor, uh, can you refresh my memory? Why were these two communities picked? I honestly these don't These two remember. communities were originally picked because they had similar populations and they were doing things with 10 full-time firefighters. Um, we thought, you know, why go to somewhere in between when you can go to the people that are doing it the best? And, and for the, for, with the, not the best, but with the least amount of personnel and cost. Um, that's why we picked these cities. Now we did find out when we got there that these cities are much different than Sheboygan. Now that doesn't mean that Sheboygan can eventually go to some sort of a full-time paid on call status. Um, but that is something that uh, is you know, to be decided. Um, obviously, if we were to, to do that in Sheboygan, uh, we would be sacrificing some things. Um, obviously, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't uh, probably have five firehouses, and we definitely wouldn't be in the, uh, in the ambulance business at that point. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's uh, food for thought. Um, but like, uh, like uh, I said and the, and the chief said, uh, uh, response times are a lot different. Uh, the, uh, the lay of the land is a lot different. Uh, the density is, is a lot different. Um, lot, not a lot of uh, two, two family homes, not a lot of people that, uh, you know, uh, you have a resident downstairs and a resident upstairs or three or four uh, families living in a structure. Uh, a lot more modern, a lot better, a uh, lot more sprinkler systems, a lot, uh, lot uh, uh, hardwired smoke alarm systems. Um, when they only have four, f four structure fires in a year, uh, that tells you that it's a totally different community than we have here. So that's one thing that has to be kept in mind in the future. Um, we did make an attempt on the way back. We had a meeting with uh, um, the uh, uh, mayor, city manager, city administrator of Menominee, uh, which has a 50-50 program, 50% full-time, 50% paid on call. Uh, unfortunately, we got there at our prescribed time and he had a, uh, a funeral to go to. Uh, so he wasn't available to, uh, to uh, entertain us that afternoon. So we didn't uh, get a lot of information out of there. Uh, my goal is to, uh, to visit some, some cities, you know, that are more similar to Sheboygan uh, that do things differently than we do. We thought we would start with the people that do things most differently than we do. Uh, however, uh, I, I don't think we gleaned um, enough information there because of the differences in our, in our cities and the number of fires, et cetera, to be very meaningful. So this is a work in progress. Um, I believe we need to find more, uh, more cities that are similar to Sheboygan that do things differently than we do and, and, and see how they do them. So that's all we have for now. Uh, are you available for questions? We seem to have some buttons pushed here. Just a sure. Things. Chief, please. Uh, one of the things that we did find in uh, Eden Prairie, and I'm not positive if, if it was the same in Maple Grove, is that they had a very aggressive uh, rental property inspection program. And um, sounds great, but they are, as the mayor said, very different to us. I don't think we saw a two-family home anywhere. Um, their rental properties, I think, consisted more of 50, 100, 200 unit apartment buildings. Um, but they did charge a fee for those inspections, uh, $50 a building and $9.95 an occupancy. They did inspect those once every four years, I believe. Um, and they too said that when they initiated it, it was not real popular uh, amongst the um, landowners. But after a while, after they started going through and getting into the individual units and helping the landlords clean the places up, um, evidently before that time they had quite a number of balcony fires of people frying outside on their balconies in these large apartment buildings. And that helped clean that up, which the land, uh, the landowners, the uh, ten, uh, property owners really appreciated that, kept their insurance rates down. Um, as we looked through the cities, and I've done a lot of comparisons on other cities uh, in the state, around the country, um, haven't put a report together on them yet. Uh, last week I was in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, thought that that may, maybe was a department that is in between um, us and, and Eden Prairie. Uh, they have about 50 or 52 firefighters, I believe. Um, 
run a staff each day of about 12 firefighters on duty, um, which in comparison to Sheboygan, we're running about 17, 18 right now. Um, the big difference there, again, is they have uh, Cudahy and St. Francis right on their borders. Um, they have a mutual aid station within a mile of their border. And they also uh, utilize uh, auto aid dispatching. So when a call comes in, uh, which says smoke showing or flames showing, something that actually sounds like there may be a fire going on, they use that auto aid dispatching and they immediately get um, resources from the adjoining departments. And that's really the difference that I've seen in all the cities that we've looked at between those cities and Sheboygan. We just don't have that. Um, when, when we call for help from the uh, adjoining towns, we get it, but it takes 20 minutes. And um, there's two things that are key to firefighting. It's response times and getting the right amount of firefighters there within those response times. And those times have, are within eight minutes. You, ne you need to get your first unit there in three or four, but you need your resources there in eight minutes. And uh, that's where we struggle here, and that's, that's really the difference is. And I think as, as the council weighs um, the options of the fire department in the city, um, you need to tell us what are the results you want from our fire department. Uh, are you happy with the results you're getting? Uh, can we not afford to continue in this mode? But you need to tell us what are the results that you want from our fire department. Thank you, Chief. Alderman Board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of questions uh, for the mayor or the chief. Uh, did, did the chief in Eden Prairie tell you why he is not in the ambulance business? It's quite a different system in Minnesota. It's uh, regional, regional ambulance services that run out of uh, the larger hospitals and cover a, a very large area. Um, they did complain that uh, they wait a long time for an ambulance uh, uh, sometimes. Like, like uh, would, it, would it be without, uh, with, uh, how should I say this, within a time frame that would not be conducive for a, for a heart patient? I would say, yeah, they said they were waiting 11, 12, 13 <clears throat> minutes once in a while for an ambulance. So they are private companies, though? They are private companies, and uh, the fire department does not run first responders. The police departments are first responders in both <coughs> cities. And I think they're able to do that because, um, as the city administrator stated, they don't have the crimes on humanity in their communities, so their police department is freed up, I think, a little bit more for those for first responding. If I could follow up, Mr. Chairman. Please do. Uh, then another question I have is, uh, had, did they go into, you, go into you, go over with you at all, kind of the blend of people that they have of volunteers? They have blue collar, white collar, and then what is, what is the difficulty in recruiting if there is any difficulty? And then what else, you know, how much do they pay them? I think you said for training, and then when they actually ha are called out to a fire, can you cover some of that? Yeah. Um, this is uh, Eden Prairie. The average uh, paid on call employee is 43 years old. Um, and what they have is they have fire, firefighter one, firefighter two, and a state certification. Uh, they train every Thursday. So every Thursday they're paid for their training time. Um, basically, uh, they must live within seven minutes of a fire station. So their house has to be within seven minutes of their fire station. Uh, but they prefer them to live within three minutes of the station. Um, Basically, uh, they carry pagers, and uh, they have a minimum that are required to be available at all times. So they have a minimum amount that are available via pager uh, to respond. Um, they provide them with all of their gear, uh, and uh, they, they pay their workman's comp, which is equal to the rate of their workman's comp, which is equal to the pay at their regular job, or $52,000, whichever is highest. So they pay for their workman's comp. Um, and, and they have long-term disability insurance. Um, Eden Prairie pays $7.50 each time they train. Uh, Maple Groves pays 12 and a half bucks an hour any time they're conducting any fire department business, including training. Um, now, one thing they do receive is a pension when they retire in a lump sum payment of, of $56 for every month that they, that they serve. So they have $56 goes into a, a retirement fund that they're paid for every month that they serve as a paid on call employee. Um, they have to serve at least 10 years to receive their pension. And uh, the, the annual cost uh, to the city is about $250,000 a year for their, 
for their pensions for their being <clears throat> on call employees. Could I just ask one more, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Uh, Chief, you were talking about inspections. Did I, are those just fire inspections or did they do the actual regular building inspections and did they give you an idea of how much revenue they're generating for Eden Prairie every year? Uh, it's just the fire inspections and they did not give us what the total amount was that they collected, just how much it was for each individual unit. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to you next uh, before you speak. I uh, just had to follow up on one of the points you brought up um, regarding, I guess, Minnesota and the ambulance service. It's something that I hadn't put too much thought into um, in many years. It's something I put out of my mind. Um, but uh, when I was 19 and a student at Mini in University of Minnesota, uh, I was brutally attacked uh, downtown Minneapolis. Um, I was six blocks away from Hennepin County Medical Center, which turns out to be that district, Hennepin County, responded with their ambulance to anything within that district there. Um, my recollection is I waited over 10 minutes for six blocks away because they were on call somewhere else. Uh, the first responder was police. Um, they literally came and left before the ambulance service came because that was within that particular territory. Uh, there was no uh, municipal. It wasn't um, um, you know, open to whichever ambulance service. I'm not sure what the plan was. Uh, all I know is that I was sitting in a commercial building bleeding for, for many minutes waiting for the right ambulance service to get there. So this, the system, I can say, is a little bit different. I don't know all the information of how it's different. They know better than I do. Um, but it's not better, I can tell you that. Um, having blood out substantially in a, in a bank uh, building uh, at 6 o'clock in the afternoon because the ambulance was somewhere else than the proper ambulance. So we can look at that further more, uh, but issues like that are coming back to me. It's something that I put on my mind a long time ago, and it's, it's not better. I think we have a better system right now. We need, well, obviously, we need to make some changes, but um, there's things to think about. Just simply having paid on call is not necessarily the answer. Thank you. If I, if I, if I may, if I, if I can say uh, this, this trip was, was not at all a, uh, a waste of time. It did give us a, a lot, of, uh, lot of good information on the way they do things there. Um, I look at it as, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the first step in the process. Uh, they are the extreme of where we're at. They are on the other end of the spectrum. And it was, it was very interesting to see the way they did things. And I, but I believe we need to find, uh, find something um, uh, more similar to our city uh, in, order to, in order to keep moving forward in this process. Thank you. Elma Hanna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, what is the total cost of fire protection for Eden Prairie or Maple Grove? If you have both numbers, that'd be great. No. Ma Maple Grove is $2,843,000. Eden Prairie was, I think, around four million. <laughs> And while you're, while you're doing that, uh, how many fire stations are in Eden Prairie and how many fire stations are in Maple Grove? Uh, Eden Prairie is 5,415,700. 5,415,700. Uh, I think four stations in Eden Prairie. Eden Prairie. And I don't honestly remember Maple Grove. I believe Maple Grove was four also. You know, one, one thing that's unique about these areas is these, these were townships. And they basically took a township, which was a rectangle, and, and, and incorporated it into a city. Um, so their land mass is much greater. Um, but also then their density is much less. So it, uh, it's an easier know, shape to cover. Basically, they have, you know, in 30, what is it? Uh, yeah, in 36 square miles, they have the population of what we have, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit over the population of Sheboygan, and we are at 14. We're at 14 square miles. So it tells you, you know, that the density of the population is much different. Alderman um, Gisha? Just a quick question. I think the council voted unanimously to, uh, I think it was added on to the budget resolution. Somebody want to remind me of that? To, uh, to have a report, I believe, by the end of December on options. Was that the budget resolution? Uh, oh, that was that the, was, uh, no, the that hiring was, freeze. That was with the other committee of the whole meeting. Okay, thank you. I, I couldn't remember which one it was. Um, and uh, to have a some sort of a layout of options and so forth. Um, 
I guess my question is from right here, the information you've gathered from here, where do you go, where do we go from here? Uh, what is the next steps involved to get to that? Well, I, we, need, we need to do more research on more like cities, number one, um, in order to, in order to uh, glean some information that is uh, more, uh, that is more uh, uh, similar to what we have here in Sheboygan. Uh, that, that would be the first step. Um, you know, a lot of it is going to be going to be guidance from the council. You know, what do we want? Um, you know, I, I know we have a uh, have a uh, uh, <coughs> talk of uh, putting in a uh, a referendum on the ambulance. Uh, if the ambulance disappears at the end of the year, um, it's a whole different ball game. If we're not doing ambulance, um, you know, then we're we're looking at something totally different. You know, there are there are several options. I, I can tell you right now, though, one option right now in the city of Sheboygan is not to go to 10 full-time firefighters and, uh, and 90 paid on call. I don't believe that's an option for us um, unless we want to lose several buildings at a time in our city. With the age of our city and the number of structure fires that we have, we have to remember right here, you know, they had four structure fires last year, four. How many did we have? Roughly 70. Yeah, we had 70. That's a huge difference and you know, that needs to be looked at. You, you, that can't be ignored. Um, you know, for the safety of the citizens, it can't be ignored. Four to 70, there's a huge difference. So, so that's, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. Uh, you know, myself and the chief, we do need guidance from the council. What direction, you know, are we going to go? Are we going, you know, are we in the ambulance business? Or are we out of the ambulance business? Um, if we're out of the ambulance business, um, you know, we, we have a different budget we're working with for the fire department to start with. Uh, if we're out of the ambulance business, we're working with a different budget without that, uh, you know, no matter how you shake it, the ambulance brings in revenue. Yeah. Uh, that revenue disappears. So then we're at a different, we're at a different basis. Um, you know, do we go down to three firehouses? If we do, which three? Um, and do we, at that point then, uh, go from a full-time staff to part full-time, part paid on call? I mean, it's all, it's all relevant. Uh, but first, we need to know where we're at. Hello, Radke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. I just had a question on Oak Creek, Chief. Uh, was that city similar in the structures and the closeness of the buildings, or was that similar to more Eden Prairie, where it's more spread out? Uh, that, again, is, I, I don't think they're quite as new as Eden Prairie, but it's more similar to that. It's, uh, I forget what the square mileage was, but it's, it's not, they don't have the issues that we have. A, of houses close together. Uh, it's, it would be more similar to the Eden Prairie. Okay, thank you. Alderman Hanna. Yeah, last, last question really, really it's a, it's a comment. I think the, the chief touched on it and really the, the discussion should be what are acceptable statistical outcomes? I mean, at the end of the day, that's the discussion. If you get out of the ambulance business and go to three stations, Right. Yeah. Another issue we have to look at, if you're out of the ambulance business and you go to three stations, you also need first responders. Um, right now our fire department is our first responders. So if we're out of that business, um, who are the first responders? That, that's another question. That Statutorily, needs to be am I correct that the police it's, it's always, cannot be? It has always been, since the police department was in the business, it's been the fire department. Right. Uh, if we're going down to three stations and a minimal amount of firefighters because uh, that's the direction that we want to go, uh, we also have to answer the question of who's doing the first responding. Uh, do we add more police officers and make them first responders? Uh, if we do, the way that the chief is policing right now is totally different because then you need your first responders in certain areas of the city at, the whole, at all times. Uh, so we have to add more officers in order to have first responders. That's an expense. Or do we take a private ambulance business and basically subsidize them to become first responders because obviously they need more staff and more ambulances in order to be first responders. So that's a question that has to be answered. You know, for every, for every savings here, there may be an expense there and it all needs to be looked at. Your Honor, if I may, uh, and keep in mind that first responders are not EMTs necessarily. And my example again is the first responders, the police department came and left having done nothing for me because I wasn't having a stroke, I wasn't having a heart attack, I didn't need CPR. But they responded. CPR. They were there. They did nothing because it wasn't a heart attack, it wasn't a stroke, there wasn't a, there was nothing they could do, there wasn't a tourniquet they could put on. 
uh, but I was bleeding from my face and nose. So there's nothing they could do. They left to go on a crime call because of the police department that responded there uh, while I waited for the ambulance service. So keep that in mind. The first responder does not equate to emergency life-saving um, techniques. Okay. Um, Alderman Bourne. Thank you. One more quick one. Uh, Mary, you were using the scenario that if we got out of the ambulance business that we would be down to three stations. If we got out of the ambulance business, we would have a decision to make of whether we were going to lay off the four people, the four people that are attributed to the uh, ambulance business. If we did lay those four people off, I guess the question would be for the chief. If we, if we did get out of the ambulance business and we laid off those four people, wouldn't you still have enough personnel left, personnel left to do four stations? Uh, that's a two-sided question because with the ambulance service, in addition to the four people, uh, goes uh, about $400,000 in additional revenue. So if you're going to take that out of my budget, mm -hmm. um, that's another seven people roughly, six or seven people. So at that point, no, we, we do not have enough for five stations. We'd barely have enough for four. Um, and I guess my comment would be, why would you do that? Why would you, why would you have status quo on your budget, but less stations and less firefighters to go to fires? That, that scenario to me does not make sense. If, if I could just follow up though, but if, we, if we kept the four individuals, we got out of the ambulance business if that happened and we kept the four individuals, then could you keep four stations open? Yes, you could keep the four stations open, but what I'm saying is it would be budget neutral, or that, that scenario would cost you more money. You'd, you'd have one less fire station and less firefighters on duty every day, so I don't know why you would consider that scenario. Well, if you got, if you got out of the ambulance business and you laid off four people, that's roughly, what, $240,000. Then you have another $200,000 $200, in ambulance, ambulance expenses, so let's say that takes 450 off of whatever the profit was from the ambulance to say hypothetically taking that off 350 to 400 thousand dollars so can you explain that if we got into that scenario then if we laid the is that just what you were saying then if we laid off the four people we lost that 250 thousand in salary and benefits and we lost the 200 thousand dollars in expenses we still got a hole of 350 or 400 thousand dollars is that what you're saying uh, exactly it's about 400 Thank you. If I may, I think, you know, I think the thing we have to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, budgetarily it's not going to get any better in the next few years, um, that we can incur more expense. The reason that we went on this is to try to figure out a way to curb expenses. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. I mean, in, in anything that we look at, uh, I, can, I can pretty much uh, be assured uh, that we're not going to have more money for our 11 budget than we had in 10. Alderman Keisha? And just to just to clarify, uh, we charge four individuals to the fire department because at the time that's what we felt uh, we added to the budget to do it, plus all the additional expenses. Uh, those four people aren't there anymore. Uh, if you recall, Alderman Bourne, we had seven retire. We hired back four. So really, you lost three of those four people. The budget is still set up to charge those four. They're just a different four uh, having nothing to do with with uh, the original plan, it's just a charge. So if you take the charge, uh, if you eliminate those four and get out of the ambulance, but four, you'd be eliminating four more. So since the first of the year, then you'd be eliminating a total of seven. But if it's just a matter of accounting, that's out of the general fund and on a separate, rev being paid for by a separate revenue source. Uh, it's like if your neighbor paid for your lawn mowing you know, uh, it gets done, but the revenue comes from a different spot, your neighbor. Um, so the four isn't four anymore, yet we'll charge it that way, because that's the way we have it set up. Frankly, if you wanted to charge 10 or whatever to eat up that whole thing, it really doesn't matter, because it, it then puts a burden on the general fund. The difference between monies coming from um, Alternative revenue sources, and Adam Payne did a, uh, a quite a speech last night at the county board meeting of some of the things they need to do. They need to diversify their revenue sources, and that's what really the ambulance is. It's a diversification of a revenue source, like your neighbor paying for your lawn mowing service. But the so if you take away the diversified revenue source, which has given us relief on our general fund, 
The difference between those two is taxpayer and raising a taxes on the general fund. On the revenue source, alternative revenue sources, that is non-taxpayer revenue. Huge difference. Uh, Non-tax levy revenue, let's say. So if you eliminate that revenue, which isn't paying for, which is paying for four, but from a, an account cost accounting standpoint, it doesn't fit the the marginal costs any longer because we've lost three on the marginal costs. But that's okay. You can put whatever you want on that. The, the other factors that uh, so if you eliminate that, it puts more pressure on your general fund, which is taxpayers, and that will put more pressure on future tax increases rather than really what. This particular, you can call it an ambulance service. You can call it what? Let's just say it's a, it's a alternative revenue source. It's a diversified revenue source. What that's done in the last two years is allowed us to reduce the budget of the fire department, which has gone down over the last two years, reduce their staff, and reduce taxes. That's the trifecta. So, uh, the point being, that's great. If you want to. Uh, if there's another plan that works better to, and for some reason there's enough bodies to do an ambulance service, dandy. But you're going to then put pressure. You got to you got to deal with the general fund mm -hmm. then besides, because it as you noted, because it does put pressure on the general fund, uh, and then and thus the taxpayers in every single uh, you know block in this town. All of them. Sure, uh, I'm, I'm anyway, almost done. It's an interesting conversation. Uh, if, for example we got to that scenario where we had to put it we had to ta put the taxes on the general fund i talked to our city assessor uh, david lusky last friday on another issue and we somehow got off on this he said it costs five hundred thousand dollars a year to run his department and he said as far as uh the, it costs the average taxpayer about twenty eight dollars so if we're talking about filling a hole of somewhere between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars that would be about what it would cost if we would put that on the property tax, on the backs of the property taxpayers, if we were out of the ambulance. Give business. or take, yeah. Give or take, so it'd probably be somewhere between 20 and $30. I would. Right, yeah, a, a year on an, on an average property. That, and we have, uh, he said we have about 17,000 parcels that pay property taxes. I think I figured it one time at $23, so 20 to 30, right. I, I, it, it makes sense, I guess. I have one more question for the chief. It's, it's just interesting. And, yeah, you're up, Scott. Uh, that, and that, uh, that question is, Chief, the, the one department that you visited, you mentioned they had 50 paid firefighters and then they had 50 paid on call. How, is that what you, on one of those, what was, what was the one where they had 50, 50 firefighters paid? Uh, Oak Creek has a staff of 52. Okay. But there wasn't. I think he was mentioning. Menominee. There was 50-50. Menominee. Oh, Menominee. Percentage Menominee is, is a 50-50 it's it's uh, <laughs> split except that. Uh, according to their chief, um, it's not quite 50-50 because they only have, I think they're, don't hold me to this number, but I think they had about 20 spots for 25 paid on call, but only had about 10 filled and could only count on three or four to actually show up. My, my question would be then, if you have a, a staff like that, let's say it's 50 paid, and then let's say 30, 40, or 50 paid on call, would you use your paid staff, you might say, for the smaller fires and just call in your on-calls when you needed them? Like, for example, just I don't want to use the example of slides, but you would use your paid staff first and only call in the on-call staff when you have a big one. Is that how they do it there or how would? Well, in, no, in, uh, in Oak Creek, because they only respond with, uh, they have three stations with a minimum staffing of four. So they respond with 12 people. That's not enough people to fight even a small house fire. Okay. They automatically call for mutual aid from uh, Cudahy and St. Francis. Okay. So to answer your question, uh, no, we would, on a normal house fire, yes, we would go with the paid people, but we would immediately have to call for other people. Um, being that we don't have a paid department next to us, we'd have to wait that whatever the time is for them to get there. Okay. It, uh, Alderman Bourne, uh, you know, they, they, don't, uh, they don't triage fires in, in Minnesota either. They don't say, okay, big fire, small fire. Um, when, they, when they have their paid on call, you know, they, they have their regular staff. Uh, their paid on call goes to the fire department. It, uh, it's, it's, everyone is a fire. They don't, they don't determine, okay, we need 10 guys or we need 20 guys. It's the guys that are on call all show up. 
Uh, one, another thing they do with their paid on call guys is they, they actually, and uh, we took some pictures of these uh, when we have a final report, uh, we'll show them to you. They, they spend a lot of money on their firehouses, uh, on the brick and mortar. Uh, beautiful buildings, huge lounges, big screen TVs, uh, very comfortable places, uh, uh, great workout rooms that they try to get their paid on call guys um, basically to use it as a, uh, as a social outlet to hang out at their firehouses. Um, that way if something happens, I mean, they sit around and uh, um, they're there. So your paid on call guys, I mean, they, they really have some, some beautiful properties that, they, that they've spent a lot of money on uh, to try to make it their second home per se that they, they, they will, uh, you know, they normally will have a few guys that are, that when they're not working are hanging out per se. And actually, both of those cities were moving towards going to what is called a, a <laughs> duty shift, I believe it's called, where they pay the people the $750 an hour to actually be in the fire station because they were running into um, response time problems. So they were starting to implement that uh, night times and, and day times. Alderman Wagman. Uh, thank you. The uh, resolution that's being introduced that I'm a <coughs> co-author of, I would just like to point out it's not a resolution calling for a decision on the ambulance service. It's a resolution calling to give the taxpayers of this city a right to tell us what they want. I can't imagine why anybody in this council floor would not want to know what their constituents want. This committee, or I should say the council, failed to come to a conclusion. We deadlocked, which was no decision at all. So now we're turning to the taxpayer, to the people, saying, look, what do you people want? And that's what this resolution is about. And I, I'm afraid we're going to get way off of it and, uh, you know, stray from the point. The point is, shall we give the taxpayer the right to speak? That's all it says. Um, I have Alderman Radke. Are you punched <coughs> in? That must have been on from last time. Okay, excuse Bye. me. And, and I agree with Alderperson Wangaman. They have the right to uh, to speak at at, at any time. Uh, and, but for us to do our job, we must supply the and answer the adequate information. Not as simple. It's not as I think you're hearing tonight. It's not as simple as a yes or no answer. For instance, if we move that money, and this would be a question for the authors, I think, uh, to consider or, or things that need to consider as it works its way through committee. Um, we get a million dollars, one million dollars a year from the state of Wisconsin in expenditure restraints. That's because we don't, we haven't been growing our general fund. What will the elimination or the increase of our general fund by the elimination of a revenue source have to do, how will that have an effect on the million dollars? That has a direct effect on the taxpayers. I think it needs to, questions need to be answered. Uh, would you accept a tax increase? Uh, without this, because it has been our reason for not having a tax increase. Um, what in the general fund would you offset? The additional monies that this puts into the general fund over and above operating costs pay for cops and stuff like that. How else will this affect other services? And if it is all going to be put on the fire department, fine, you know, implode the fire department down, that's fine. But then what, is, what should the citizens be able to expect for response time? What should they expect in, 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 in help from both, from all the services that would be affected for that loss of revenue? So in its, in its most basic form, I agree with you a gazillion percent, but without that data, so that the citizens have an idea of, of, uh, of what's at stake, because we're involved with these things closer than they are, I think it's only fair that all that information be given to the citizens to make a decision. Alderman Wagaman, you'll be next. Um, before I get too far in this issue of the question of the um, um, putting it to the uh, referendum, uh, that document has been referred and would be more appropriately, I believe, to be discussed in Finance Committee uh, <coughs> as we're not prepared to discuss it tonight. Um, and if the Finance Committee decides to refer it back to Committee of the Whole, I, I welcome that. Uh, we can all be more prepared for that way. It was uh, also referred to Committee of the Whole. It was, but yep. we're side of the agenda this evening. Oh. Um, having said that, I will let you respond, Alderman Wagaman, and then we'll move on from there. Good. The, the only reason I brought it up was because it was brought up here tonight. And uh, I, I agree with Alderman Gisha. But the question is, shall we permit the people to tell us? And once they do tell us what they want, then it's our duty and you're as you said, a zillion, I'm a zillion percent in your uh, quarters and on that one. 
then it's our duty to tell them, okay, you folks said you want a referendum. Now, if the referendum goes this way, it's our duty to tell you what's going to happen. If it goes that way, it's going to be our duty to tell the people what happens. It, and from that, I think they can make an intelligent decision. Uh, had, had the authors, I'm sorry if I could follow up and then I'll shut up. up on and we'll and on. <laughs> have the authors of this resolution considered any of these or done any work to have the data for this to be presented to the various committees it was referred to? Yes, there is some, there is some data available to us already. And that data, which I'm sure we'll look at in the next committee, the whole meeting, when it's been That would be great. Thank you. Us. So we'll, uh, I'm going to move on from that point. Uh, seeing no other lights on this issue, uh, Mayor, Chief, I thank you for your information. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's not an actual item this evening. It's only a discussion item. Um, so uh, when we wait for the um, information regarding the referendum discussion. question and the information, uh, as Alderman Wong has spoke about, um, uh, as documents come in front of this committee, we will discuss it further. Thank you. All right, we do have three um, uh, documents um, somewhat dealing with the same issue. Uh, discussion of possible action on issues regarding fire, de fire department and ambulance service. Uh, communication 1510-11, 586 from Greater Sheboygan Committee. Communication 2-10-11, 443 from Beverly and Henry Schaefer. And communication 3-10-11, 4-44 from Richard Teamey. Uh, are any of those um, citizens or citizens groups avail uh, here to speak on those issues? Ellen, please come forward. Thank you. Um, the Greater Sheboygan Committee's interest germinated as a result of the uh, Finance Committee report, which uh, laid out scenarios where, over a period of five years, uh, some alternate uh, funding difficulties would be experienced by the fire department, and I'm assuming every other department, considering the parameters that were placed upon that particular study. I guess at that time, we took a look at a number of options, and uh, uh, as at the timing of that particular document seemed also to coincide with the resolution to then hire for firefighters. Uh, at that time, we forwarded our paper and also spoke to the council specific to a couple of things. Uh, one would be that to hold on the particular matter of hiring the four firefighters at the time of the first reading, uh, that was uh, basically uh, taken care of by the three-man hold. Uh, our logic was we felt it was important to hear the Special Budget Committee's report and really hear from all the departments to get a broad global impact on the budgetary picture for the coming year. Uh, the hiring of four firefighters uh, is not without risk and dependent upon uh, the retirement uh, profile, if you would, of uh, future firefighters, but it seems to be one of the things we looked at, a reasonable short-term response. And I guess our issues were, what in the short term seems to make sense, and that what, what would be a reasonable long-term solution, or a long-term alternatives, not only for the fire department, but I would, I would argue perhaps for all of the departments, uh, to, to look closely and uh, very critically at how services are delivered, uh, as was mentioned tonight, what does the community want and are there viable alternatives that haven't been considered? Uh, I think at that time I spoke about uh, the old fire uh, house having uh, the place where they used to haul up the hay for the, for the horses. And in many ways, that's the model that uh, fire services were built on originally. Volunteer fire departments, uh, we had industries that were fired with coal, and uh, Sheboygan still enjoys the, the old Sheboygan, the density that we see in many of the particular places. However, once we started looking and reading what the literature had, it seems that there were longer term alternatives that we felt could reasonably be, be, be vetted and looked at. And one of those seemed to be the paid on call. The typical uh, route via the Fire Chief, which is a, an excellent magazine for those of you who, uh, who wish to follow the, uh, the, the firefighting journal, if you would, seems to be volunteer departments then go to paid staff and continue to have paid on call. And there are some risks along with that. I don't think that we, from the get-go, said that this would be the perfect model. 
Uh, there is a calculus that I think the mayor and fire chief are already looking at that will be what would the data set call for in terms of trying to uh, find comparables and then if you would matching the best possible alternatives. So I think in terms of our particular interest, uh, we're pleased to say that many of the activities that this council has taken move along in the direction that we felt would be appropriate for looking not only at the fire department but other departments are in these trying budget times. Uh, Thank you, Eldon. Alderman Hanna. Thank you. Uh, Eldon, the reason I voted to, to hire four firefighters was really to give us the bias time to look at a, a short-term and long-term solution. Um, and I think the, the mayor and the fire chief have made the first step. We need more data. Mm -hmm. um, there's pros and cons of all the systems. And, I, and it still comes down to, at the end of the day, what are acceptable outcomes? And I think we need to make, like in any business decision, uh, you need to take the statistics and, and educate the taxpayers uh, to the point where they can make an intelligent choice as to what's acceptable to them or not. And I, I appreciate the, the data and the time you folks put into uh, producing the reports and uh, you know, thank you for your the time and effort. It can be thankless at times. Thank you, thank you very much. Any other questions? <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you, Alden. At this time, I'm looking for a motion on the three uh, communications. Motion to file. If there's no additional citizens uh, represented by these. Motion made and, and seconded to file. Alderman Bourne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to mention that uh, Beverly and Henry Schaefer are constituents of mine and who I hear from quite often on, an, on a number of issues. And the email from Mr. Themey, Mr. Richard Themey, is also a constituent of mine. And both of these, both of these documents were unsolicited. They just sent them to me, and so mm -hmm. I passed them on to the council, and they were referred to the appropriate committee. So I, I thank, <coughs> them, thank them for taking the time and communicating with me, and uh, I look to hear from them in the future on many other issues. Thank you, Ellen Bourne. Is there any other discussion on the motion to uh, file? Okay, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Motion carries. Next on the agenda, discussion of possible action on annual proposals for action by Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance, RO 126-10-11, 762 from Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance. Is everybody this evening who would like to speak on that issue for the Taxpayers Alliance? Um, well done, okay. I was gonna say I did actually receive an email saying that they stand behind the document and will not be speaking oh, today. No. Uh, it looks like Ellen's not speaking. He's just leaving. Um, is that correct? That there's no wish to further speak? You may. You may. You, you spent the effort in writing it. I ask you to speak upon it. Uh, before you uh, speak, I did receive an email. Uh, asking uh, to forward the communication on, which I did via email today, um, as it was not have time to put copies on your desk. So those of you who were able to read your email, uh, did get an email from the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance urging not to file and to submit uh, various items to various committees. Uh, so they did receive that email today. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you, what you just said, if it pertained, pertained to my, my speaking here at this time. Uh, no, it was just simply that I received an email from the Taxpayers Alliance asking that I refer uh, that we don't file the document that we refer to various committees mm -hmm. uh, and I did forward that email on to all the various members of the uh, council today. Thank you. I was I didn't know when uh, the public was going to be allowed to speak on any of these issues this evening. I came prepared with a uh, word for word statement here printed out and uh, it happens to include item number seven which we just finished with so parts of this you want me to go, uh, Miss Alderman Gisha? What's that? Would you uh, would you allow me to uh, start from the beginning of my? Uh, I, I, you have no problem with that. <laughs> Do you, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Thank you. As Chairman's uh, decision, please continue. Stop my decision. I'd like to comment on just two items that are on tonight's agenda. The first one being number seven. For anyone who may not have an agenda to refer to, it reads Fire Department and Ambulance Service. This item consists of three communications, all from respected upstanding citizens. 
I believe the concerns of these people deserve your well thought out consideration and action. That being that this committee send a favorable recommendation to the Common Council, a recommendation that reflects the wishes of these people and many more who want this issue finalized. The second item, I'm sorry about I had to go back to number seven, but the second item, number eight, reads, discussion and possible action on annual, annual proposals for action by Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance. This item refers to a lengthy list, and I know it's lengthy because I helped to compile it. A list of suggestions from some pretty well-informed people who have determination but not always enough time to concern themselves with the ins and outs of local governments. Basically, the list consists of ideas on how to reasonably serve the populace with an emphasis on using less tax dollars. Now who can argue with that? As for discussion tonight, other than what I am saying, or any other private citizen may say, not much discussion is expected. By its makeup, the only action asked for would be to send a favorable recommendation to the Common Council, along with a strong commitment by all aldermen to address the contents of the brochure throughout the coming year. I want to thank all of you who took the time to listen to me and heard what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments this evening? Any comments from the committee? Are there any motions at this time? Alderman Hanna? It's, it's my suggestion from the follow-up email we received today that the appropriate committees uh, you know, tackle items as deemed appropriate for those committees. I think that it, we work best through the committee system, and I think the, the email you forwarded to us uh, would allow us to make some referrals. So my suggestion is perhaps uh, uh, give Sue some guidance so that the various committees can be cognizant of, of areas of the taxpayer alliance reports that they should focus on. Very good, Mr. Hanna, Alderman Hanna. Uh, for those that have not had a chance to check their email today, um, it is an email from Dick Susha of the Sheboygan um, County Taxpayers Alliance uh, requesting that item number one in the report go to strategic planning. I'm assuming that's strategic fiscal planning um, committee for uh, us to discuss. Items two, four, and six to finance. Items three to salary and grievance. Item four to PPNS and finance. Items five, two, and seven to public works. And item six to redevelopment authority. Is that your motion, Alderman Hanna? I'll make that motion. Second. Motion's been made and seconded for uh, those referrals. Uh, Alderman Hanna? Two. Yep. Is there any other discussion on that motion? All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Next on the agenda, discussion and possible action. Ethics complaint filed against Alderperson Versi, R143-10-11, 727 from Susan Lassard. Uh, I see Susan Lassard's here. Would you like to speak? Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. The letter I wrote to the council bears serious issues. As the city faces other challenges, it brings me no pleasure in standing before you tonight on this topic, yet it must be addressed. The state statutes state, no public official may use his or her pos office or position in a way that produces or assists in the production of a substantial benefit, direct or indirect, for the official one or more members of the official's immediate family, either separately or together, or an organization with which the official is associated. It also states, nor take any official action substantially affecting a manner in which the official, a member of his or her immediate family, 
or an organization f with which the official is associated has a substantial financial interest. This is chapter 19, subchapter 19.59. Our city municipal code states, section 2-261 under definitions, a financial interest means any interest which shall yield directly or indirectly a monetary or other material benefit to the officer or an employee or to any person employing or retaining the services of an officer or employee. Personal interest means any interest arriving, arising from blood or marriage relationships or from close business or political associations, whether or not any financial interest is involved. With that being said, on June 21st, Alderman Bowers made a motion which failed, and then Alderman Versi made his motion, and I quote from the Common Council minutes, a motion by Alderman Versi and seconded by Alderman Bowers was made to amend to lift the hiring freeze and eliminate the ambulance service was lost on the call of the roll. The discussion that evening was to give the ambulance service back to Orange Cross. Scott Versi is married and his wife works for Orange Cross Ambulance Service. The whole discussion of the ambulance service, in my opinion, <coughs> is a matter that Alderman Versi should not comment on, nor make motions to, nor vote upon. It is a direct conflict. This council and the taxpayers are aware that the opportunity for another ambulance service to come to this city is minute. Stating that we will open bids to the other ambulance companies is only remotely the truth. It is difficult enough promoting competition without an older person handling handing the contract to his wife's company. To further express my concern as to the ability of Alderman Versi to separate his own personal agenda from that of our city was blatantly apparent on July 6, 2010, and I quote from the minutes, RO number 143-10-11 by the city clerk. Submitting a communication from Susan Lassard stating her upset with Alderman Versi regarding his comments about the fire stations and ambulance service. A motion by Alderman Radke and seconded by Alderman Bourne to file the report to the officials was lost on a call of the roll. The aye votes for this vote for this matter was Bourne, Bowers, Koth, Kittles, and Radke and Versi. The nays were Bauk, Bausch, Orgisha, Hammond, Hannah, Montemayor, Vanderwilly, and Wangerman. On a motion by Alderman Gish and seconded by Alderman Hanna, the report of officer was referred to the Committee of the Whole, all aldermen present voting aye. Even on these votes, Alderman Versi is unable to distinguish what he should abstain from. To think that he would be able to conduct himself in an ethical manner is the question. To further my concern, in a recent request for information from various alder persons, the following was included, and I will read the email in its entirety. From James Boren, sent Monday, June 7, 2010 at 3.52 p.m. to Corey Bauk, subject, reason, re, I am willing. Alderman Cor Bauk, Corey, I just got your phone message and I agree with your talking points. I will talk to Dennis. Number one, Alderman Hammond called me and he will be at council and not finance. Number two, Alderman Versi would have stood up, but Alderman Radke and I thought because his wife works for Orn Cross, a non-issue, the fire department would have put up a big stink in the media if he was part of the hold. Dennis, and number three, Dennis in no way wants the, fr the freeze lifted. There was enough of a conflict of ethics to have the Alderman Versi not join in on their three-man hold. Our council should set the code for their governing body. If Alderman Versi's conduct is acceptable to you, then you will set the precedent and there will never be a need to abstain. This is illegal and dangerous. The important issues that face this council are many and they should not be undermined by tolerating unethical behavior. If it is your intent to allow this behavior, it'll make one wonder just how many issues will be compromised in the future, causing delays and lawsuits. If the ambulance service is to be returned to the private sector, let it stand on its own merits and not be compromised. I believe in transparency in local government. I believe in ethical behavior. I have seen it on our council floor and in committee meetings. I have personally abstained from discussions and votings on, uh, voting on issues that my vote may compromise the findings. You have the opportunity to investigate my request, a request submitted by a voting taxpayer in this city. Thank you again for the opportunity and the ability to witness good local government in action. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Lassard. Are there questions for Ms. Lassard? You one first? Okay, I'm sorry. Alderman Hanna. Yeah, thank you. I do, I do have a follow-up question. You did, a, you did an open records request? Yes, I did. Uh, did all the aldermen respond? No. Who was the request made to and who responded? The request was made of attorney, or excuse me, Alderman Bowers, who did not respond. Alderman Boren, who responded and said he had no emails. Alderman Bauk, who did respond. And Alderman Radke, who did respond. Any follow-ups, Alderman Hanna? That's okay. all. Alderman Bowers? I take issue with I didn't respond. I sent a note and I delivered it hand, uh, handmade to the clerk's office as you requested. Didn't you receive it? No, I did not. Well, I'm sorry, but it was placed with uh, Linda Long and it was dated July 10th. I did not get it. Well, okay, but uh, I don't want to be put in the category that I didn't respond. The response I was, I, I have no emails to any of these aldermen that you asked me for. Okay, well that's your response. I just did not get it, but I didn't, in what I had to speak to this council, didn't address who I asked for information from. It was a request from a question. A question among aldermen if we had had any communications with emails between us was the question. No, the question was how many people responded to my information request. That was the, the question, question posed to, to me. The question asked to me was, I want a copy of all emails between me and I believe Mr. Mackey, uh, Versi, Boren, and Bulk. Well, I didn't ask for Alderman Versi, and that was the request of my email from the four of you, yes. And I responded, there weren't any. You're telling me that now, so well, you, you had the same response as um, Alderman Bourne, yet I read an email from Alderman Bourne in my address to this council. But I didn't, if I didn't get it and you didn't have any, then what is your point? My point is, if I had to respond, knowing your behavior, you probably would have come after me with another uh, uh, I'm going to take offense to that. I think if you're... Alderman Bowers, uh, Mrs. Sard, uh, the issue at hand is not uh, the information request. No, it's um, the, the, um, Is the documents, um, which is claiming uh, Alderman Versi um, has an ethics violation. Uh, so I'd like to move on beyond that. I think you made your, both made your points. Uh, so I'd like to move on from, from that. Is there any other questions for Mrs. Sard? I have one. Alderman Bowers? And I'll get back to over here. First of all, Ms. Lassard, the first email that you sent me, I never received, which I, which I communicated with you. And then, and then when I did communicate with you, I said I did not have any emails, but I specifically said, if you had anything with my name on it, send it to me to refresh my memory, which you never did. You said, thank you for your response, but you did not have the courtesy to forward that other email. Uh, I, I, as a rule, I don't keep emails for six months. I keep them for three or you know, two or three weeks and then I delete them. And that's why I said I didn't recall, but I asked you for the courtesy that if you had something with my name on it, to send it to me so I could respond to you directly. You never did that. No, so I, I didn't. I, 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 I would appreciate that courtesy when I ask you to forward it to me, and you didn't. You thanked me for my response, but you never, you never extended the courtesy of forwarding it to me so I could comment on it. If you could remember the rest of the email you sent me, you told me that you normally don't email anyone, that you normally pick up the phone and talk to them. That's correct. I had a number of emails that you had sent. Your response was you didn't have them. There was no reason to send them back to you, in my opinion. I, your job to me was to request the information. My job to you is not to provide the information I already get so that you can take a look at it. I didn't, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't send you specific emails because I didn't have any in my memory of what I had sent. And I asked you specifically if you had emails with my name on them to send them to me so I could call you back and comment on them. And all you did is thank me for my response that I didn't have any. So I would have appreciated anything that you had with my name on it that you would have forwarded it to me so that I could have called you and responded in a more <coughs> appropriate manner. I don't know what the rules are for aldermen to keep their correspondence. That's not my job. Alderman Boren, again, Ms. Lassard, I'm going to ask that we uh, move forward again on the discussion. Okay. Um, it's, it is pertinent to a degree. Um, I, we do have, I did ask the uh, uh, city attorney uh, to be present, uh, and he'll be able to answer any questions regarding the length of time required. Uh, we can move on to that issue later on, or I can schedule that later on. 
So any discussions, uh, Alderman Wagman, your president? I, I have just one question. Uh, we're talking a lot about emails when it appears to me that this is a question of whether Alderman Bercy acted unethically or not. Has it been shown that if Orange Cross, say, were the designated ambulance service, that his wife would profit? Has Thank you, Alderman Wagan. Has anybody got any information on that? Has, has it been demonstrated that she would, would profit? Because that's what this is all about. Correct, and actually that brings it more to the point, and thank you for uh, the, the question. Uh, the question today is, as lights are lighting up, um, as uh, my understanding of the role of the Committee of the Whole in this situation is, if there's enough information that warrants an investigation, the document should be referred to us, again, but in the uh, purview of uh, the Ethics Committee. The Ethics Committee has the right to uh, swear uh, witnesses in, uh, as well um, as to subpoena um, any witnesses as well, whereas the Committee of the Whole does not. If the uh, complaint does not rise to um, the level of investigation, uh, then the proper motion is to file uh, at this point in time. Uh, quite frankly, the, the discussion um, on the Ethics Committee uh, is not appropriate for this committee itself. And yes, I know it's the same 16 people discussing the same issue, uh, but it's under a different... Um, uh, different committee structure is what we need to do. So that's the question at hand is does it move forward or does it not move forward? Uh, thank you Alderman Wagman for bringing that point up. Um, Alderman Hanna, you're next. Yes, I, you know, it's, it's from my school board experience to my experience here in city council, um, it's been my cr practice, and it's just my personal practice, uh, to err on the side of caution. Uh, a couple years ago we shifted to St. Nick's to also offer in Aurora. My wife works in the accounts receivable department of Aurora. She would not benefit in any means whatsoever from that, but I abstained from that vote. Um, I've been approached by citizens that said, well, don't you manage money at Maritime for some of the city unions? No, we don't manage money for city unions at Maritime. Um, so I just, you know, it's been my practice to be a little bit more conservative. Uh, even when I've been given guidance from Attorney McLean that it's a gray area, it's your call, <clears throat> I've just chosen to, to abstain. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alderman Versi has to do what he thinks is right for him. However, I really don't see a problem because we right now have no, the city has no business relationship with Orange Cross in any shape or form, zero. And, uh, and I think it's uh, conjecture on Ms. Lassard's part to say that if this went out to bid, that it's a, it's a slam dunk that Orange Cross is going to get this. You remember years ago when we put this out to bid, we had Curtis Ambulance from Milwaukee come up here and they were the ambulance provider for a while and then they made a business decision to no longer be the ambulance provider. So to say that it's a slam dunk uh, that if we decide to get out of the ambulance business and then it's going to be Orange Cross, uh, I think is pure conjecture. I, you know, there's a, maybe we'd only get one bid. And if that would be the case, and the council was asked to, to do a contract with Orange Cross, I'm sure, I can't speak for all of university, but if I was in his shoes and I had a, a spouse that worked for Orange Cross, at that point, I certainly would not vote on a contract for a company that my wife works for. But as I said before, right now, we have absolutely no business relationship with Orange Cross, zero. And therefore, I guess I have to agree with the decision that Alderman Verse made based on that. If we had a business relationship with Orange Cross, or, we would, or we're gonna have one in the future, I'm sure he would have abstained. But right now, there is no business relationship. Are there any other questions this time? Deep. <laughs> um, I don't think Alderman Versi is an unethical human being, and I don't think his intent uh, through this process was uh, to be unethical in any way whatsoever. But that makes this a pretty good exercise because it resets all of us on the ethics policy of this city. It doesn't say if they do business with the city, Alderman Bourne. It says in great detail, you heard it read, uh, appearance of, um, I mean, it, it, there has to be some sort of uh, uh, logical 
um, conclusion is they're the only option in town that voting to get rid of one to give another one an opportunity I, I feel it's it's not even close it's a no-brainer I never would have personally never would have voted to uh, uh, I would have abstained on that I've abstained when Johnson Banks names been on closed session documents in uh, redevelopment authority yet it wouldn't benefit me it's a completely different division a completely different anything but that name was on there and that's my employer I'm out of there stood up walked out of the room I've seen aldermen in this room go through hoops to stay out of any to give and it's not just an individual it's the appearance of the council and the integrity of the council to remove any doubt cloud or or, uh, or bias um, and, and to me, it's more of a, a group exercise here, and I personally have no interest in elevating this. Zero. None whatsoever. But I think the uh, fire department issues are, are not an issue. Uh, the ambulance would be because of a uh, potential appearance uh, and the family relationship. But I personally do not believe Alderman Versi was intentionally being unethical in any way. Zero. It's just not there. Uh, but uh, we as a whole are affected by we as individuals. And uh, as a whole, uh, I've seen, it, it's been pretty cool actually, uh, Alderman really twisting and turning. Alderman Bauck last week uh, on Monday just did some PR work gratis for an organization that we were voting on uh, giving a, a, a contract to. He was way out of it. Uh, he, he begged off uh, on an abstention. I've seen abstentions going like crazy. It's not a bad thing, and it's not a hurtful thing. It's good for all of us to err way on the side of caution. But to me, this isn't even a, a gray area. It's not even close. There's no way I would have ever uh, voted or made a motion uh, on the issue. Not a chance, because uh, I think it casts a, a shadow. And that's the point of the ethics guidelines, is to remove shadow and doubt. And uh, I think if Alderman Versi um, would uh, abstain in the future on ambulance issues uh, because of his uh, personal relationship uh, via marriage, uh, I have no issue with putting this to bed, personally. Alderman Longman, you're next. I certainly agree with Alderman Gesha. Uh, asking us to make a decision on an unfounded supposition is very, very difficult. Would have been a little bit like when I was in law enforcement if the judge said, why did you bring this man into court, officer? I'd say, well, he was looking in a jewelry store window and I thought he might break it and take a watch. So I arrested him and brought him into, into court. The judge would have threw me right out the window. And I can't make a decision on an unfounded supposition. If somebody would have said, well, you know, if uh, we have a contract now or a contract is pending and uh, Alderman Bercy's wife would get a raise out of this or some such thing. I say, well, yeah, that's terribly unethical, but we have none of that here. We, we have a little bit of smoke and mirrors. We have a vague appearance that something might be wrong, but please don't ask me to make a decision on something that's an unfounded supposition because I can't support that, just as Alderman Gisha said. And I, I think we ought to take this whole thing and just put it to bed. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with Alderman Gisha 100%, and I'll make a motion to file. Second. Motions have made and seconded to file. Um, is there any questions for Ms. Lassard at this time? Thank you, Ms. Lassard. Thank you. Um, I see that the mayor and the city clerk would like to make, perhaps clarify some issues that came up during the discussion. Uh, for the committee's sake, we also do have the city attorney uh, present. If there's any questions that uh, we have for the city attorney at this time, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I am speaking here as the mayor. Um, I'm speaking here as a, uh, a former member of the council. Um, I'm, also, I'm also speaking here as a... Uh, I have a relationship with Alderman Versi and that his father John here has done architectural work for me in the past. Um, I, I myself, and in my years on the council, I abstained from many votes. Mm -hmm. If I had a commercial property that it was a vote about redoing the road in front of it, about doing sewer work, uh, I would abstain on that vote. I don't think Alderman Versi had any ill intent on making the motion that he made. 
However, to say that there is no personal interest, uh, no monetary gain is ridiculous, no business relationship is ridiculous because Orange Cross and the city are competitors. There's a business relationship there. We're competitors. We're in the same business. Um, I don't want to see this go to the Ethics Committee, <coughs> but I really would like to see Alderman Versi abstain in the future for the sake of the council. I see Alderman Hammond, Alderman Hanna, abstaining regularly when they have a remote client in their company that they do business with. I see Alderman Gisha doing it regularly. I see, I see Alderman Kittleson. Anything that has to do with fire department retiree benefits, insurance that she is under, she abstains from. This doesn't belong in the Ethics Committee. No. It doesn't. It's not good for the city. However, I would really like to see Alderman Versi just make the commitment that when it comes to fire, when it comes to ambulance issues, ambulance issues, that he abstains in the future for the sake of the council. That's all I would like to see come out of this. Thank you. Senator Clark Richards, did you have a comment? I saw your hand before, so. I saw your hand before, so I just. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to clear up with I'm sorry. We are being televised, so. Just a quick clear up on Alderman Bowers, um, and it's just to do with email, and I know this is not the issue right now, but it was said um, when Ms. Lassar did, from what I understand, requests from different Alderman emails, copies of emails, they were directed to bring them to my office and that Ms. Lassard would come there and pick them up. Alderman Bowers did drop off a slip of paper that said, I do not have any emails that you're requesting. We left it on the counter. I'm not taking responsibility for mailing or delivering or anything. It was supposed to be picked up. So I just want to let you know that he did drop something off, just to clarify. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, Alderman Hammond, you were punched in before. You have comments? No, I'm, I'm good you're for now. You're out? Okay. Um, Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask uh, Attorney McLean a question. Attorney McLean, please come forward. <coughs> Go ahead, Attorney Alderman Bourne. Attorney McLean, my question is, is how long should I and the rest of the council keep their emails before we delete them? Is there anything in the statutes about that, or do you have a recommendation? Uh, well, number one, there's, there's a case on point, um, directly on point, where an open records request was made and the uh, individual replied that no longer had the email that had been destroyed. Uh, the requester brought a, a complaint under the open records law. The court said that's not an open records violation. So the citizen didn't have any right to any recourse under that. Uh, so it's really a separate issue, the uh, records retention requirements under the statute. But the general presumption is uh, governmental records should be kept for at least six years. Uh, we had a discussion on, on this subject at the, yeah, the council orientation yeah. session for the new it. alderman and uh, perhaps we should have broadened that to, uh, to all the council uh, it's obviously become a big issue uh, uh, everywhere throughout the, the state and the country uh, and one uh, one way to deal with the issue that I've seen in other communities is to provide all the aldermen a city email account where you could conduct your governmental business through the city's uh, email account system and then automatically a record is kept at the end of each month as to what the, what's on the, the server and those are permanently kept for, for proper uh, records retention purposes in the event the a request is made. Uh, Right now, 
you know, it, it's it's hard as an individual alderman. You're on your own. I mean, you keep your own stuff. Uh, you send your own emails. Uh, you aren't given uh, computers. You aren't given anything uh, access to the network or anything as far as retaining those things. Uh, but yet, you know, as I say, the presumption is should be keeping those things for an extended period of time. Uh, I think that's a fruit, you know, a, a a good subject for further discussion in. I don't know, Committee of the Whole is the, the right uh, forum, but uh, finance perhaps or somewhere uh, to, uh, to consider the city adopting a program like that where uh, aldermen could use a governmental email account separate and apart from your own private uh, email account to keep track of the records. And so you don't have to then personally worry about records retention and concerns that everything on your computer at home might be viewed as a public record and there's a lot of issues that come up there. If I could just follow up. Go ahead, Alderman Moore. Uh, so then what you're, what you're saying then, uh, we don't necessarily have to keep them on our computer for six years, we would just have to keep a copy, uh, of a, a copy of the correspondence, a hard copy, a paper copy, but you're not saying that we have to keep them on our computer for six years. No, you wouldn't have to necessarily keep them on your Computer. I mean, my computer wouldn't move anymore if I had. <laughs> you, you can keep them on a disk. Put them on a disk. Or on a disk. Yeah. yeah. That is something I want to follow up with Alderman. But again, that's not an. It's not an open records violation. <laughs> if that's of any. Uh, I'm sorry. Consolation. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand what you. Would you repeat that about the open records violation? Yes. Uh, if you don't have a record, whether you threw it away or never had it or never generated it. Uh, you don't have to respond to the open, open rec records request if you don't have the record. And it doesn't really matter under the open records law why you don't have the record. Okay. So that's not an open records violation, but could be a public records retention issue that is not enforceable by citizens making open records requests. Correct. Clear as mud. Uh, to follow up, um, I do ask the Finance Committee um, to look into uh, providing each alderman an email account. Uh, my current employer requires me to do all business through there. On my laptop, it comes up, but also on my phone or any other device I want to access the web, I can access that email. So the, there couldn't be that much cost involved in simply establishing a web-based email site for all of us, and then all these issues would just simply... Did you say a specific Perhaps committee? Uh, Finance, this I was hoping goes off I, we have a, an a IT steering bit. committee that that might be very appropriate for. Then perhaps IT steering committee would like to meet and discuss these issues. Thank you. To go off a little bit on that, um, the Wisconsin Supreme Court just last Friday, I think it was, uh, issued a long-awaited decision regarding uh, <coughs> email records of uh, employees and I think it would the same rationale would apply to to aldermen as to uh, whether personal communications that you send via email say uh, you know can you do lunch on Friday or something like that whether that because of the fact that in this case it, it was a city network and was saved on the city server well I guess it was a school district uh, but whether mere fact that that was then retained by the school district on the server, whether that personal sort of email became a public record. And the court uh, ultimately decided that those sorts of personal emails are not subject to the open records law. Now, they didn't come up with a majority as to the reason why or why not, but the net result was that uh, the employees, in that case teachers, who were trying to prevent these emails from being released were, were successful. Uh, so that would also be helpful uh, so that if you had access to the city's network and there were some issues as to you, you sent perhaps an, a, a personal communication on the network, uh, doesn't necessarily mean automatically that just because now the city 
has retained that on the server, that that becomes a public record. You really have to look more as to the content of the email. Well, the uh, more reason I think that the IT but the thought would be should that look at. <laughs> if you guys were allowed to have email access in the city server, that you would use that for government business as opposed to your own private email accounts. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Um, actually, Alvin Versi, you were next in line. Was I? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, as far as committee and council is concerned, I have no problem abstaining from ambulance issues only. I will not abstain from fire department issues. And that's where, you know, that will be, sounds like the consensus anyway, so I have no problems with that. We have a motion and a second, Mr. Chairman. We do have a motion and a second. We do still have a discussion. Alderman Hanna? Yeah, I just, I, one more question, question while we have the expert up here. Um, I've received group emails in the past and I've cautioned older people that if there's a majority of a subcommittee, uh, let's say a majority of public protection and safety, a majority, of, I've cautioned them that we could be having a walking quorum and that I'd, I'd prefer to be left off of those emails. Can you just briefly touch on whether email communication between three out of five of a standing committee creates a walking quorum? Uh, sure, the uh, question is, uh, this is under the open meeting law again, that uh, says the presumption is when you've got a majority of aldermen present uh, discussing matters of governmental business that are the subject of uh, their, their bailiwick, that the presumption is that that constitutes a meeting for purposes of the open meeting law. Uh, that applies both to physical presence where uh, a majority are physically together as well as uh, telephone conference calls, uh, email, uh, or any other means of communication uh, and applies not only to the council meeting as a whole uh, where you would, uh, or the committee of the whole, say the committee of the whole, you'd need nine to constitute a quorum, uh, a majority. Uh, <coughs> with a committee, you've got, we've got risk management committee has three aldermen on. A majority of that committee is two. Uh, you know, so theoretically, though two of the three are discussing items that are subject to the risk management committee, unless that discussion or meeting is be, has been noticed properly 24 hours in advance, that that's an illegal meeting. Uh, and that's true even if you're sending email communications. However, email communications are a little different in that uh, typically they're a one-way thing initially. You send out like mailing a letter. That the process of sending out the email is not necessarily a meeting or a communication, but where you run afoul of the open meeting law is when the nature of the emails becomes more like a conversation where somebody else, your recipients, you sent out an email to several people uh, and they're all responding back in sort of real time uh, with their comments and then you're responding back. Uh, situations like that where they become more like a meeting as opposed to you send an email out, uh, two weeks later you get a response. That's, that's really not, even though it's done by email and you send it out to everybody on the council, uh, that's not really a violation of the open meeting law. But you, know, you run the risk of sending out uh, shotgun emails of other aldermen responding back and starting all these <coughs> conversations online that could potentially create open meeting law problems. Okay, thank you, Attorney McLean. Thank you. Um, the topic at hand, again, is the motion, which we would have a motion made and seconded. Um, uh, if much of the information that Attorney McLean is speaking to us sounds familiar, it is because we have heard it before, and it was the uh, training session. 
um, which I know a lot of the new people were here for and a lot of the existing people were not, uh, I urge you next to the existing people that have been on before, do come to the training sessions. There is so much information that we could even get to uh, in, in two hours, I believe we were meeting. Uh, there's some more. Uh, it is very important. Uh, I can add a topic for Committee of the Whole on further discussions with that, uh, but I ask that we focus back upon the uh, question at hand, and there's been a motion made uh, and seconded on that motion um, uh, to file. Uh, Alderman Radke, you're next. No, I'm sorry, you're not. Alderman Warren, you're next. Uh, can I ask? That. <laughs> can I ask? Could I ask Attorney McLean another ethics-related question uh, that is not exactly with the matter we're doing here? That would have to be another time, right? Um, I'll allow it this time, but let's keep it, try to keep it close to the topic at hand. Well, it is ethics and how people vote on things. Please, <clears throat> uh, Attorney McLean, if we have a uh, if we have a standing committee, and I'm going to use the, the I'm going to use the example of the insurance committee that we have, and there are people on the insurance committee. There's older persons on there, and there's other people on the insurance committee that are directly the decisions that are made in that in that committee uh, are directly related to a benefit they're going to receive as far as insurance is concerned. Should employees or older persons that are directly will directly benefit from actions that are taken in the insurance company, should they, be, should they be voting members of that committee and only aldermen that are, that are on that committee that are not beneficiaries of, of a health insurance plan? I, I guess I have a problem when, when city employees and possibly some older persons who may be a direct benefit of insurance, even if that, even if that older person would abstain on voting on a health insurance matter, but in that committee is building policy that would affect would affect them or, or their family is, do you see any problems with, with the way that committee is set up? Uh, yes, if that's what the committee is doing, if the committee is reviewing insurance, group <coughs> health insurance issues and making recommendations to the council, uh, you know, I think the genesis of that group was, there were two separate groups. There was a group health insurance committee and then there, if I, memory serves me right, there was a separate labor management committee that was had members of each bargaining unit the purpose of that was to try to keep dialogue between labor and management where a representative from each of the unions could be present and there could be some discussion as to what was going on but it really wasn't a policy setting at least the intent in my view was not to be a policy setting sort of uh, forum. It was more uh, an informational sharing mechanism. Uh, but, you know, those sorts of things are fraught with potential issues where uh, you start meeting as a group like that and they kind of take, a, uh, take on a life of their own. And, uh, and I think, you know, potentially you do run into problems there. Well, the issue would be who would be voting members and who would be non-voting members. That's, I mean, it's great to have all of those parties together to discuss things, but I think there's a potential issue there of who should be voting on, on the issue. Well, I don't, I don't disagree with you, uh, Alderman Boren, at all. Thank you. Yeah. Alderman Radke. Call the question. <clears throat> Second. Motion made to call the question. All in favor, call the question. Aye. 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 Chair, what's I opposed? Question's been called. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, to file the document. We've heard from Alderman Versi. Motion's been made in a second. Um, we've heard a lot of discussion about that. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Chair votes aye opposed. Abstain. Motion carried. Excuse me. What? Abstention. Um, next date and time of the meeting will be August 4th, 2010 at 7 o'clock p.m. Same chambers here, August 4th. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion made in a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. We are, we are adjourned.